Hey guys, today we're going to talk about cycles of matter. Before we get into exactly what cycles of matter are, let's just review a little bit about energy. Energy, we've talked about a couple times in class, is going to be cycled throughout an environment. It's important for living things, and if you remember from Rare Hog, your characteristic of life, um, energy is required for living things to be living. Now, we know that organisms are going to use that energy for daily life functions. In particular, those daily life functions are going to boil down to chemical reactions. The synthesizing and digesting of molecules to build body structure, but then also digest food for nutrients, that's what we're going to be using that energy for if we're not moving around and doing other things. Now, at a, at a cellular level, that energy could be used for transporting nutrients across the cell membrane during active transport. It's also, you need a little bit of energy to kind of kickstart chemical reactions, and one of the important chemical reactions in, in animals and plants is going to be cellular respiration. We know that, of course, that produces energy, but we also need a little bit of energy to get that reaction started. Now, the rate at which those chemical reactions occur in the body is going to be the organism's metabolism. So, of course, energy is essential to an individual being. However, it's also critical for a healthy and stable ecosystem. You need to have energy flowing through your ecosystem in order for individuals to be living. And that's a vital component in an ecosystem because we're looking at how living and non-living things are going to react. Now, those living things besides needing energy need things like minerals and food and water. Some important atoms that are involved in those minerals and foods are going to be these six below, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. We discussed these back in biochemistry, and I said, well, you can remember them because I come up with a little acronym SHNOPS or CHNOPS, and that helps me remember because the, the element symbol is associated with the first letter in each of those words. Now, energy is flowing through an ecosystem one way. It starts with the sun, gets absorbed by plants, and then is transported from one trophic level to another. However, matter, on the other hand, which is what we're really interested in in, the, in these notes, is actually recyclable. And it's very important that it is recyclable because we do not have an unlimited supply of it coming to us from something like the sun. So how do we get something to be recycled? These matters, this nutrients, these atoms, how are they cycled throughout an ecosystem? We could not have this happening without decomposers. So things like bacteria and, and fungi that break down dead organic matter into nutrients for the soil. That's the key. So they are able to, to take the elements that are found in in various organic or organic things and they're able to turn it into a reusable form that something like a plant could use or that we're able to eat and in doing so it's cycling that throughout the environment now how are those those nutrients and matter being cycled are through something we call biogeochemical processes and a biogeochemical process is anything, any biological process or geological process or chemical process that will be used to move those elements or matter through various aspects in the environment. So a biological process could be respiration. A geological process could be volcanoes. A chemical process could be photosynthesis. Um, they're just various means. Now, the three cycles that we're interested in and how these biogeochemical processes recycle these types of matter are going to be water, carbon, and nitrogen. You've probably heavily studied water and carbon cycle. Um, so that's great, but we're still going to touch on them. And the last one is going to be the nitrogen cycle. So let's get started. The water cycle, as you're probably very well aware, has various points in which we cycle water from a liquid to a gaseous state. Now moving from a liquid to a gaseous state is called evaporation. 
the sun's going to boil some water, it's going to get hot enough, and it's going to get so excited that it evaporates or turns into a gaseous molecule and starts floating around in the atmosphere. Now that's really happening when water's heating up pools of water from the ocean or the river or a puddle. Now we can also lose water from plants, which is why plants are pretty territorial and protective of their water. The loss of water from a plant is known as transpiration works very similarly to evaporation except it's being basically drawn out of the leaves of a plant. Now once that water is in that gaseous state in the atmosphere it's going to cool down because it's not going to be it's not going to need to be as hot and when it cools down that water forms around tiny particles of dust and condenses into clouds. Now when those clouds become saturated or so full of water they're going to get heavy and when things get heavy, they fall. So when the, the water falls back to the earth, that's a process known as precipitation. Now, usually we just think of evaporation, condensation, precipitation. However, we need to think a little bit farther about how that water gets back to other bodies of water. So when the when the water precipitates back to, to earth, it can either join an existing body of water, like an ocean or a lake or a stream. It could hit the ground and it could be absorbed, or perhaps if the ground is impermeable to, to water being absorbed, or it's saturated with water itself, that water is gonna run across the surface of the earth and it's gonna find its way to the nearest body of water. So go ahead and on your sheet right now, I want you to diagram out the water cycle. I want you to draw pictures for important organisms or structures found in the water cycle. And I want you to add um, arrows to show the movement of water, but also label what's going on and what part of the water cycle you're looking at. So be sure to include evaporation, condensation, precipitation, uh, transpiration, absorption, and runoff. The second phase is carbon cycle and carbon is important to all living things because it is a key component in building our tissue because our tissue is made up of proteins and proteins are an organic molecule when you're looking at the cycle of carbon between various geological uh, chemical and biological processes there are two main processes that fuel this cycle and that's going to be photosynthesis and respiration now photosynthesis, as we studied earlier in the semester, is going to be the process of converting sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water into sugars. So how is this impacting the carbon cycle? It's going to be removing CO2 from the atmosphere. And in that CO2, you of course contain carbon. So that's removing carbon from the atmosphere. Now respiration, the other side, is going to be when the organisms take that sugar which again contains carbon, and it's going to break down or digest that sugar back into some smaller components, recombine them back together, and turn it into carbon dioxide, which, like its name implies, also contains carbon. So therefore, finishing that cycle between carbon being removed from the atmosphere and also returned to it. Other factors that affect the carbon cycle, the first is decomposition decomposition is going to return carbon to the soil and the atmosphere because when a decomposer bacteria or fungi break down this dead apple they are eating the apple so they're respiring returning carbon dioxide to the atmosphere but any carbon that is not consumed is then going to be absorbed into the ground it's going to be broken down and released into the ground so that producers can absorb that carbon or other nutrients and continuing the cycle of carbon moving between the ground and living things and also the atmosphere. Another way that carbon is cycled throughout the atmosphere and physical objects is going to be through the burning of fossil fuels. When you burn fossil fuels what you are doing is, is, is basically burning um, once living organisms and once living organisms contain carbon it's trapped inside of them so you are breaking apart that material that made up that once living organism and releasing 
carbon dioxide as a byproduct. An abundance of this carbon dioxide actually contributes to climate change because it, it helps absorb sunlight and trap in that heat and can over the course of several decades, if not longer, contribute to climate change. Deforestation, uh, something that we don't always relate to the carbon cycle is a huge, has a huge impact on whether we're able to remove or not carbon from the atmosphere. Because when you think about it, what you, what you are cutting down when you deforest is going to be a tree. And trees are a producer and producers are, are one of the major if not only organisms that are capable of extracting CO2 from the atmosphere. So if you're getting rid of the, the trees or the producers that are capable of removing that CO2, you're basically cutting off and cutting down the lungs, if you will, of the earth. You're getting rid of one of the only organisms that's capable of keeping balance between carbon moving in and out of the atmosphere. The third and final cycle that we're going to talk about today is the nitrogen cycle. The reason you need to know about the nitrogen cycle is because it's a vital component in one of our organic molecules, proteins. It actually is part of an, um, the amino acids. Um, and since you need to have proteins in order to have body structure, you really need to have nitrogen. The funny thing about nitrogen is that there is an extremely large amount of nitrogen available in the atmosphere. That when you breathe in right now, you're very possibly breathing in some nitrogen. However, the ironic thing is that that nitrogen is not in a useful form. You're not able to inhale nitrogen and then use it to form amino acids and therefore proteins. Instead, we need a middleman. That middleman is going to be bacteria. So by bacteria undergo nitrogen fixation which means that they are found on the roots of bean plants, which we call legumes. It could be a bean plant, it could be a, a peanut, but they are found in these roots. And what they do is they actually take atmosphere, at atmospheric nitrogen from the atmosphere and they convert it into a usable form that the plant is able to absorb. And that usable form is called a nitrate or um, an example of that would be ammonia, kind of like the cleaning product, but not in nearly as high of a concentration. So that's how we get nitrogen from the atmosphere. The bacteria turn it into a usable form. The plant then absorbs it, and then, of course, you eat the plant and get the nitrogen that you need. Now, how do we get the nitrogen back into the atmosphere? Because it's a cycle, we actually use a process called denitrification where again, we have to use that bacteria, that when you go to the bathroom, you produce nitrates in your urine, and you produce things like ammonia, and that bacteria is gonna break down the nitrates and that nitrogen back into a nitrogen gas, which then is released back into the atmosphere, completing the process of, nit of the nitrogen cycle. So this is the end of our Cycles of Matter notes. What I want you to do now is to answer these four questions. Um, answer them on your sheet, and if you have any problems, go ahead and come and see me, and I will be glad to help answer your questions. Thanks, guys.